Good morning. I have a question for you to start off our time together, and that is, how many of you would consider yourself directionally gifted? Maybe you go to a new place and you can quickly, I saw a hand or two, I, you go to a new place and you can learn your way around that pr place pretty easily. Uh, my husband is like this, and I find it amazing. We've been to DC a handful of times, and he learned his way around DC so fast. And so people now will say, hey, I'm going to DC, and he'll ask this question, he'll say, oh, whereabouts? Which I think is an odd question, but they tell him where uh, they're staying, and he'll kind of look it up, he'll say, oh, and he'll look at me, and he'll say, that's near where we stayed five years ago, right near the National Zoo. And I'll think, okay. Or he'll say, oh, that's right by the Pentagon. You just turn right at the light and you go about a half a mile down and it's right there on your left. And he'll look at me for some kind of confirmation and I cannot confirm nor deny. I have no idea where we stayed or where it was in relation. Um, I also have a friend who is um, not much better with her sense of direction than I am. And we've decided that it would be fun to travel together. So we have visited friends in different states. Um, multiple times, and not surprisingly, multiple times we have gotten lost. We almost expect you by now. A couple summers ago, we met at a local park, local, here in Rochester. Um, but before I start this story, in case you can see where this is going, to be fair, it was a really big park. Uh, but we had a great time together, we were catching up, we were walking, we were talking, we took a couple selfies, having a great time, probably for about an hour and a half, and all of a sudden I realized, I'm turned around. I'm not sure where the car is, but my friend, you see, she drove us there. So of course she would know where her car was. So I mentioned to her, I said, hey, I'm not sure where the car is. And she says, oh, I just think it's, yeah, I think it's around the corner over the hill and we'll be there. So we went around the corner over the hill, but now I'm sucked in. I said, no, no, I think you're kind of right. I think we'd have to go a little bit further around this and over that. Anyway, we walked for another hour and a half. And um, my desire to not be embarrassed was decreasing compared to the urgency I had to find this car because I was hot and I was tired. So uh, I implored her, I thought it was a good idea, and she did too, to call her husband. I don't know what we thought was gonna happen. Was he gonna come pick us up and drive around the park? But she did call him and he informed her that there was a lovely app on her phone that would direct her to her car. Hallelujah. Well, some of you who are directionally savvy might be surprised or entertained by um, my lack of directional wisdom and my mishaps that have happened. Um, but the reality is that, there are all, that we all have times in our lives where we need help with spiritual direction. Many of you may have felt lost at some point in your life, and I'm not referring to geographically. Maybe you felt lost before you learned about God's grace. Maybe you actually felt like you were doing really well, you were succeeding in your profession, or you had a great relationship, but you still felt a tug on your heart that something was missing. Maybe at some point in time you felt torn between two decisions. They both seemed good, but you couldn't do both and you had to make a decision. At these crossroads, the good news is that you don't have to figure it out all on your own. God is at work in our lives even before we know he is. We just started a series last week on the Holy Spirit and we talked about how the Holy Spirit is lovingly active and present in our lives. The Holy Spirit is active in our lives. What does this look like? Maybe you're like me and there have been times that you've prayed for something. You've prayed and then you've kind of felt like some direction, but do you struggle with, was that from God or was this just my thoughts? How do we know, how can we discern what was from the Holy Spirit? And maybe we even actually wonder, has the Holy Spirit ever spoken to me? And if so, have I ever heard him? I think that's a pretty significant question because if you wonder if the Holy Spirit has ever spoken to you, but you have some Christian friends in your life who will say things like, I just really felt the Spirit of God impress something upon me, but you're not sure if this Holy Spirit has ever spoken to you, it can kind of be like you're the unpopular kid in a gym class or at work. And so I think that's a significant question. We're gonna come back to that in a little bit. Um, but there are a couple of times that I've been out hiking and I've started to wonder, and this is not gonna surprise you, knowing my proclivity occasionally to get lost, but I've wondered, am I on the right path? 
Am I even on the path at all? And I've wondered this because I've been hiking along and I get to a place and all of a sudden it's almost a fork. It's, it seems like the path goes this way, but if I think about it, it kind of looks like this is kind of a path too and how do I know which way to go? I have to make a decision, so I, I kind of go the way that I think is right and then I have this hallelujah moment because there's a marking on a tree. It's a sign letting me know that I am indeed on the right path. I, was, I don't have to worry about figuring it all out myself. There's a sign, it's confirmation. Someone had been there before me knowing that someone else might be wondering if they were on the right path. The passage that we're looking at today has a similar type of signpost for us. It's from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse one that states, now about the gifts of the spirit, brothers and sisters, I don't want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. In this chapter, Paul is speaking to a church in Corinth that he helped establish himself just a few short years before. While he was there, he preached to them and shared with them the good news about Jesus. So most of these believers were probably quite young in their faith, not having been Christians for more than three years. They would all clearly remember their lives being changed by God. By the way, I think that there are some times in our life when there are people that we want to know about the goodness and the grace of God, but have you ever felt inarticulate or just maybe theologically lacking, like I can't share with them because I don't wanna do a bad job misrepresenting the gospel. But the one thing that people can't argue with is your experience. They can't argue what your life was like before you knew God and then after you were transformed by him. Maybe we used to be fearful, but now we have more courage when we step into a challenging situation. Maybe we used to constantly look to a relationship to fill an intense void in our lives, but now we don't do that nearly as much because we see that God has filled that space within us. Maybe you struggled with unforgiveness before, but now you have grace that you can extend to yourself and others around you. And in case you heard one of those examples and think, I think I'm still struggling in that area, that's okay. God is still at work in us, we're all works in progress. His life transforming power is huge, but it is a process. The focus here is that unless you had the blessing of knowing God from your earliest years, then something changed quickly for you. There was an immediate awareness of God's love and you walk differently because of that. And if you are someone who has had that blessing of knowing God since you were oh so little, that doesn't mean that you're disqualified. You have the ability to share what God has protected you from and also what he has done in your life. In each of these situations, that is your story. And people don't typically argue about your stories. They don't argue that you used to be more anxious and now you have more peace. They might argue theology, but they can't argue your story. And the people in Corinth whose lives had been radically changed just less than three years ago, they would clearly remember what their lives were like then. So the intro to this session, to this section of scripture, might sound a little strange, but it was understandable to them. The intro says, you know that you were pagans. Pagan doesn't sound like a compliment, but it wasn't said with a biting tone either. It was more like, hey, you remember how you were before you knew God. You were led to whatever belief system around you led you astray, and there were many options. But these believers, they didn't understand the Holy Spirit. Who was he? How was he working in their lives? Was he working in their lives? And Paul wanted to take a minute to let the people of Corinth know they didn't become Christians just because they were oh so smart and finally figured it all out. Before encountering the truth of Jesus, many people in Corinth worshiped Greek gods. They worshiped Poseidon, who was believed to be the god of the seas and the storms and earthquakes. Apollo was believed to be the patron god of Corinth, and they believed that he warded off evil. Aphrodite was considered a protector of Corinth, and there were three temples to her alone. This wasn't considered Greek mythology. These gods were actually worshiped and looked to for provision and protection. 
And then Paul came. He stayed for a good length of time. He shared with the people. He wanted to share with them the life-transforming truth that had changed him. Before, Paul was a man that would persecute Christians, put them in jail, and even have them executed. Then he had a life-changing experience with God. And then he became a man whose entire goal in life was to share about this love that Jesus has for all of them. Paul was radically changed. He was radically changed when God made it clear that the Jesus he had been persecuting was actually God in the flesh. Paul now declared Jesus is Lord. This wasn't a mantra that he shared. He was declaring that because of this, there were ripple effects throughout his life. Paul wants Jesus to be the leader of his life from here on out. And the people in Corinth were radically changed as well. They all came to the same realization that Jesus is Lord. But Paul wanted them to know, again, that they didn't just figure it out in their brilliance, but he also wanted them to know that this didn't just happen because an amazing teacher swooped into town with amazing eloquence, with a plethora of great five-point sermons, with some amazing PowerPoint presentations. We know this because he said so earlier in his letter. He says, I came to you in weakness, with great fear and trembling. This is not how we typically picture the man who penned most of the New Testament. He goes on to say, my message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of the Spirit's power. And why? So that your faith might not rest on human wisdom, but on God's power. So what do we make of this? Is Paul just being self-deprecating? Is he kind of hoping for a compliment for the people in Corinth to say, no, Paul, really, you're amazing, you are eloquent, it's because of you. I don't think so. Paul doesn't typically, as we look at the New Testament, seem like the kind of guy that struggles with self-esteem. But Paul doesn't want them to walk around saying that a guy came in and showed them about Jesus. That's not it at all. Paul realizes that if this is their takeaway, then they've missed it. Paul wants them to know that he is not the hero of their story. Paul's motivation is for them to know the Holy Spirit and how the Holy Spirit was crucial in their lives, moving them and preparing them to even hear the message that Paul brought. Looking back on a couple of verses that we examined this morning, now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. What do we learn about the Holy Spirit? He gives gifts. Who doesn't love gifts? For some of you, this is your primary love language. Uh, the very first gift that he gives is letting them understand who God is. For those of you that resonated with that question before and you wondered, maybe you've never had the Holy Spirit's clear direction. And yet you're saying that you are a believer in Jesus and you're sure that you had a time that God became real in your life. The good news is that the Holy Spirit revealed that to you. No one can say Jesus is Lord unless the Holy Spirit reveals this truth to you. Often we are completely unaware of the compassion of God and how it's moving toward us and going before us preparing a way, just like someone prepared the way on that hike that I was on, putting that marker up. The Holy Spirit does that for us, giving us every opportunity to learn of the grace and redemption that there is in Christ. This is the very nature of God. The Holy Spirit is a gift giver and a guide, and that has been part of the redemption plan from the moment that sin entered the world. When Adam and Eve were created, they were created in the image of God, and he blessed them. God intended to have a close relationship with them. He gave them a gorgeous place to live, good times that lasted for about a page and a half. The one thing they were instructed to not do was to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One major command, but at the end of the day, Adam and Eve did not trust God enough to obey. That's where most sin starts. When we sin, we don't believe that God has our best in mind. We think that he is withholding something good from us. Adam and Eve started the chasm between us and God. 
They were exiled. There is a separation between them and God. And I think we tend to sometimes think that we're paying for their mistakes. I see these memes on Instagram and people, it's like when we get to heaven someday, we're gonna kinda see Adam and Eve and kinda give them the side eye and think, I know what you did. But it's not just that. All of humanity ever since then has struggled with sin and struggled with separation from God. But this scenario did not take God by surprise. God started delivering his people and planning our rescue mission long before he actually sent Jesus. Jesus' death on the cross to pay for our sin was the ultimate fulfillment of God's plan. But the role of the Holy Spirit in this process is crucial. One of the things that is so cool about God is that he loves us individually and uniquely. He made us with our unique personalities, our giftings, our passions, but he also knows where we struggle. If I were to ask each of you how you first came to know God and how you were first impacted by your love, I would have hundreds of different answers here in this room. That's because God doesn't create us using cookie cutters. He reacts to us individually. God is all about relationship. Those of you with multiple children know that your kids don't all respond to the same way of teaching and correction. Uh, my kids used to love to go to the Henrietta Town Park when they were little, and shockingly, they never wanted to leave. So I would tell them each ahead of time, I would say, you have 10 minutes before we have to go. But I would say it differently. To Anna, I would say, Anna, you have 10 minutes. You have time for one slide, two times across the monkey bars, and five minutes on the swings. For Hope, I would say to her, I would say, Hope, you have time to make two new friends and play with each of them for five minutes. <laughs> for Hope, it was all about the social. For Anna, it was all about how much she could do. I had the same goal, but I communicated with them differently. God knows that we don't all respond the same way. And because he's a personal God, he will use many things in our lives to help ready the soil of our hearts. I think that's a good description, the soil of our hearts. It's kind of what a farmer uses, a gardener uses. When a real gardener is planting something, I use that phrase because I have friends that are real gardeners and I just like pretty flowers. But when a real gardener is planting something, uh, they use different fertilizers for different plants. They know some plants are more susceptible to certain sicknesses or poisons, and so they do things to protect them. Some plants thrive in sunshine, where other plants thrive in shade, and the person who's tending to those things knows those things. God knows each of us. He designed us. He knows where our weaknesses are, and he's often doing things to protect us from things. Sometimes he tries to protect us from us sabotaging our own growth. But God is not just moving parts around on a chessboard. He's interacting with us individually. The Holy Spirit might sound vague, more vague than the person of Jesus, but Jesus speaks about the Holy Spirit a number of times and describes his attributes. There's a passage in one of those times where he's describing in John 16 about how he's not gonna be with the disciples forever, but he tells them, you are filled with grief because I have said these things, but very truly I tell you, it is good for you that I am going away. Unless I go away, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. The helper, okay, so the Holy Spirit is a helper. What does this look like? When we think of the word helper, there is a whole spectrum that we can think of when we think of that word. When my kids were little, I would ask them if they'd like to help me bake cookies. I don't know if you've ever had little kids help you bake cookies, but it's a very interesting thing. They break a couple eggs and you're, they do a great job, but you're kind of getting out a little bit of eggshell. You ask for a cup of flour and it's a little bit mounded, but they're tossing it in and the kitchen is a mess afterwards. I don't think this is the perfect analogy to think about the Holy Spirit as a helper. A slightly better analogy is thinking about how a parent teaches a child how to learn how to ride a bike. I remember when our daughter was little, she wanted to learn how to ride a bike, and she asked Greg and I to help her. Help her? We had to teach her everything. We had to show her how to wear the helmet, where to put her feet, how to balance as she was pedaling. We were guiding, 
directing, holding the whole thing up. She couldn't have done it at all without us. I think that's a better way to think of it. But to be fair, Anna had a role too. She wasn't passive in this. She could have been too scared and chosen not to try it. Anna had to trust us and listen to us. And she had to let us hold the bike up, even when she wanted to do it herself. But as she listened and as she trusted, she learned how to ride the bike. The relationship between us and the Holy Spirit is so similar. The Holy Spirit paves the way. He draws us. He invites us into a relationship with God. He allows us to see the need that we have for him. The passage in John that we were just looking at goes on to say that the Holy Spirit will convict us. Good, that's exciting. Will convict us regarding sin and righteousness and judgment. But honestly, that's not meant to be a buzzkill. We can't come to the Lord and receive his grace without first realizing our very big need for it. From the get-go, our role is to choose whether or not to accept the invitation. Do you want your life to thrive on the adventure of a lifetime with the God who created you and who knows you, trusting that our God, our designer, knows what's best? And the relationship with the Holy Spirit doesn't end the moment that we ask Jesus into our lives. This is where the analogy of the Holy Spirit and the parent and the bike riding thing, it breaks down a little bit because Anna now spends most of her life in Oklahoma and she does ride a bike. And I am very thankful that she doesn't call me and say, mom, I need some help. Are you free today? Fortunately, she has the ability to ride the bike herself, but our dependency on the Holy Spirit is ongoing. The Holy Spirit is active and continuing to help us throughout our lives, teaching us, showing us how to pray, and so much more, which we're gonna cover in the next few weeks. But making choices to respond to God is an ongoing process throughout our lives. I'd like to invite the worship team back up. But the lingering question is, how do I know if something is from the Holy Spirit? Are there any litmus tests? Well, the Holy Spirit doesn't contradict the word of God. So if you think that the Holy Spirit is telling you to cheat on your taxes so that you can be more generous at church, that's, that's not gonna happen because God does not contradict himself. That's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit might actually be the subtle voice in the back of your head that's making you pause and reconsider that. Or maybe you have a verse popping into your head that says, give unto Caesar what is Caesar and unto God what is God's. And you no longer feel comfortable cheating on your taxes. Sorry. <clears throat> One other prompting that may be from the Holy Spirit is regarding those gifts that we talked about earlier. First Corinthians goes on to describe those gifts that we have. They're not just for our benefit, but they're actually to help people around us and partner with what God is doing. For those of you that, part, that went to Hope Day, perhaps that was the Holy Spirit encouraging you. If you're getting a prompting to love someone or serve someone, that very well might be from the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit first exposes and convicts someone of their sin and their need to receive God's love and grace. But this is an ongoing process that the Holy Spirit is quite active in. It's not just a one-time deal. I know that a week after I accepted Jesus into my life, I did not have it all together. And if you ask anyone in my family who knows me well, they would tell you I still don't have it all together. However, I can affirm that the Holy Spirit continues to gently invite me to repent, to change my heart, my attitudes, my actions, and we have the opportunity to respond when he prompts us. My encouragement to you today is that if you've ever wondered if the Holy Spirit has ever spoken to you, then my answer is yes. Maybe he's speaking to you right now. If you feel like you have a hard time discerning when he's speaking, the good news is we can ask God to attune our ears to hear him. He desires us to hear his voice. Sometimes the issue is taking the time to be still, to put down our smart devices, to ask God before we ask all our friends and Google. <clears throat> my question, my challenge for you today is about where you are on your journey with God, with the Holy Spirit. Maybe you heard that verse before about, that says, nobody says Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit, but you have never wanted to personally acknowledge God 
as having dominion and leadership over your life. But today you heard that verse afresh and you felt the Holy Spirit saying, now is the time. My encouragement is to respond. If the Holy Spirit has been challenging you to step out in any way, I encourage you to follow. Practically, that could look like taking a step of faith to pray for something that seems just beyond your reach. It seems almost impossible, but God's putting it on your heart to pray for it. I encourage you to pray for it. Maybe he's asking you to share with someone that you work with about the good news of God. Maybe he's encouraging you to respond in forgiveness to something that you've been holding a grudge onto for a very long time. And you think, but God, I am so wounded by this. There are so many things that God will invite us to. He will continue to give us invitations. And every time we have the choice of whether to numb our ears to his promptings or to live a life that thrives under God's leadership, what will you choose today?